we are proud to present the Changing the World Through Moments of Care speaker series. I got very overwhelmed, but you were there. You always sent me care packages when I went off to sleep away camp. I did grow up in a community of public service. Life is about lifelong learning and we never stop learning. I'm so excited that you're all here. Thank you for joining us as part of the Care Speaker Series. It's an incredible time. It's all part of the changing the world through moments of care. And I'm just an honor and in awe to be able to present this panel to you of people who are the world's most iconic and influential and most accomplished, frankly, foreign policy leaders as a part of this one called Moments with World Leaders. And I gotta tell you, and so many times you have people who need no introduction, they say, but these next three individuals truly need no introduction. And I'd be remiss if I did not encourage you, if you don't already know all of the fascinating things about their careers, all of their wonderful books, I encourage you to do so. But I'm gonna focus on an opportunity to really pick their brains today and have a moment with three, three secretaries of state for the United States of America as part of this phenomenal series to get a sense of what global leadership must look like at a time when we've all been saying we're all in it together. And on this 75th anniversary of CARE, I can think of no better people than to have this conversation with. So please help me welcome Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, and all Secretary of State John Kerry, and I am Laura Coates, and I'm just thrilled to be with each of you here today and to have this wonderful conversation. So thank you all for taking the time to share your insight and wisdom with all of us today. Thank you. You know, I'd love to get right into it because I'm telling you at a time, you know, CARE, they sent one of their first CARE packages back in 1946, that's when it was delivered. And the world at the time was recovering, as you all know, from the devastation of World War II. And there are so many parallels right now when the world is forced to reckon with the instability, thrust into a time when we really are all in it together, you know, combating different things for different reasons. But I wonder if each of you could speak a little bit about the parallels that you're seeing from that particular time to now to really bring it home for us why and what global leadership must look like. Let me begin with you, Secretary Madeleine Albright. What are you seeing as the parallels? Well, I think there are parallels because the world really was uh, a mess in uh, right after the war. That's a diplomatic term. Um, and so many things that had happened during the war with the fighting and millions of people had died. And there was a question about what next and what would be any structures where those that had not suffered as much would be able to help those who had. And I do think that there are parallels now because we are dealing with an unknown situation of a pandemic that has affected people in ways that we are learning about that we didn't know all about. And there are real questions as to how um, the other countries and peoples are going to react when they see other people suffering. Um, and when we do have the capability of helping and we need to figure out a structure that is capable of delivering that help to those the way CARE was able to help in 1945-46. You know, I see you nodding and I thought to myself the idea of the ability to care, but I also think about the idea of how just like then there were obviously some competing priorities, this idea of do we stay within and become contained or do we offer the help that needs to go across the globe? Do you see those parallels as well? I do. And I, I think that um, it's a really uh, propitious time to be talking about this uh, corresponding with CARE's 75th anniversary of sending that first CARE package, uh, the leadership of the um, United States and the West at that time understood they had to do several things simultaneously. They had to alleviate the terrible human suffering. They had to hold the war criminals and the instigators uh, of the violence uh, that swept the world accountable uh, and they had to figure out what to do going forward that would try to minimize uh, the possibility of another world war. Those were huge responsibilities. 
But what CARE did uh, was almost uniquely American uh, because it wasn't a government program. Uh, it was certainly encouraged and supported by American government uh, leaders and interests, but it sprang up from uh, the real concern of Americans about what was happening after the war uh, to the suffering, uh, to all of the people who had been dislocated. And the idea that Americans, after having gone through the Great Depression, gone through the Second World War, uh, would contribute to an organization that was going to be trying to help people elsewhere in the world was such uh, an American uh, process, such an American initiative. And I think we see that again. Um, we didn't have social media. We didn't have the internet back in 1946, uh, trying to figure out what the needs were, communicating uh, that back to the United States, setting up the organizations. That was all you know, a complicated, important uh, organizational challenge. Today, we have um, technology. And when we see, for example, what's happening in India with the absolutely horrific spread uh, of uh, COVID throughout that huge country, you know, so many Americans are stepping forward, trying to help in some way, trying to go through organizations, trying to raise money online. So the impulse is still present, uh, but I think we're going to have to do more to coordinate both leadership from our government and institutions, our not-for-profit sector and our business sector to help the country really address the global needs that we're facing because of the pandemic and to help the world uh, try to recover uh, it's in our interest to do that. It's the right thing to do. And I'm hoping that organizations like CARE can continue to set uh, such a high standard and a good model. And Secretary Kerry, the idea of the impulse to build off on that, I mean, the impulse is still there, the instinct, the concern, the altruism. But, you know, we're talking about what happened when CARE first sent the package. You're talking about the tangible aid. But perhaps what Secretaries Clinton and Albright are speaking about, are there parallels as well in terms of the intangible diplomacy as that vehicle as well? Do you see those parallels? Well, there, there's huge par parallels, obviously. Um, I, I think the most significant thing is, is the importance, frankly, and I say this without any note of chauvinism, but, but pride, and I know Hillary and Madeline feel the same way, the importance about American leadership. Uh, we, we, we saw a world in total disarray in 1945, the end of the war, 46, and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and it desperately needed to be rebuilt. Uh, economies were in shambles. The only economy standing was really our own. And so we, um, we stepped up uh, and we helped, more than helped, we shaped the post-war order that put together the United Nations, the world, the monetary, international monetary system, Bretton Woods and so forth. And, and for years, all the way through the Cold War till the fall of the Berlin Wall, that position of leadership was essential. In the aftermath, the world sort of achieved a different status, I think. People did what we wanted them to do, which was build up their economies. Look at Japan, Germany today, two of our absolutely strongest allies, strongest democracies, strongest economies. And, and so, uh, you know, we came into this period of, of doubt in the aftermath. I think Hillary will agree with me that we could tangibly see it. Those of us who were in electoral politics saw how uh, the 1990s began with the Gingrich Revolution and a change in our politics, a change in America's ability to play its role, traditional role in the world. But all around the world, people weren't, 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 you know, somehow divorced from what the meaning of our leadership was. And you look at, you know, Vaclav Havel and Lech Walesa and people leading revolutions around the American idea. People who sat around listening to the voice of America. People who still believed in, in uh, what Madeline, well, I guess she described it privately off camera before we started, but coming into New York as a young woman, uh, and seeing the Statue of Liberty and being received as one of those immigrants coming to our country. Uh, that's who I think, and all of us, I think, share a belief that's who we really are. We are not the country we presented to the world 
over the last four years, which was completely contrary in every way to the belief structure and to the accomplishments of what created uh, the world that we had lived in up until then. Now we've got to reshape it and rebuild it. And we face enormous, enormous challenges. The, the challenge obviously of our economies, of COVID, uh, of inequality around the world, racism, which seems to be sharper somehow in its relief. Uh, and of course, uh, the challenge of the climate crisis which is existential to many people already today and will be to even more people if we don't respond. So this moment calls for American leadership yet again, I believe, and I say that again without a note of chauvinism, but Madeline once said, and, and I think you know it's now a iconic phrase that America is the indispensable nation. There are things that just don't happen unless we come to the table with the strongest economy in the world, the strongest military in the world, and I think the strongest core set of public values and and of, of a, a belief structure around which people still want to organize themselves in their lives. And so, uh, you know, CARE stood for all of that. CARE was a manifestation of that thing that Alexis de Tocqueville called so remarkable about Americans, which is they actually care about each other. They engage in charity. There, there's a community. They build community and care about community. Um, and, and I think that's back where we are right now. This is a precious moment on this planet. And America and the principles that guided care are the principles that I think um, are needed today to restore a balance uh, that respects sovereignty of other nations, but also understands there are core universal values around which we need to organize ourselves. Secretary Clinton, the idea of what Secretary Kerry is speaking about, this idea of equal parts optimism and boldness, and this idea of restoration as well. Do the United States has obviously benefited from quite some time of being able to have the bold leadership, to be able to have um, the ability to have the strong economy. It's really compared to other countries. Do you have any concerns about the ways in which the United States is viewed now compared to say 75 years ago and its ability to still offer that bold leadership, that still idea of America and the idea of democracy as a vehicle for so much to really bring home the point of what what we believe are American core values of altruism and diplomacy and ambition and caring. Is that still on the table or do we have some ways to go before we can yet reintroduce ourselves? Well, it's a great question, Laura, because I do think that the last four years um, did a lot of damage to America's standing in the world, to our global leadership on <laughs> so many important uh, issues that we were taking the lead on. And then uh, the former administration uh, basically uh, retreated and rejected uh, that uh, kind of leadership. I think that uh, our allies and our friends um, are still a little bit um, wounded from the way that they were treated and the inability to really count on uh, America keeping its promises, whether it was in the uh, comprehensive agreement reached to try to put a lid on Iran's nuclear weapons or the Paris Accord to try to get the world working on uh, climate change or even, you know, not not being willing to uh, continue arms control agreements with Russia, uh, turning a blind eye to aggressive behavior by Russia and some of the moves that China is making, you know, the list goes on. So I am very uh, pleased to see how hard the new Biden administration team is working uh, to rebuild our alliances and our relationships to once again uh, make America's position on these critical global issues clear uh, to seek out ways of once again assuming leadership. And I, I really applaud uh, President Biden for asking uh, Secretary Kerry to come back and pick up the work that he had been doing when he was secretary uh, in the second term of the Obama administration. Uh, there is so much work to be done. And I think President Biden did a uh, real service to us by 
clarifying what the struggle is uh, when he recently said, we are in a struggle between democracy and autocracy. Can we prove that complicated modern democracies with all of our differences, with adversaries from without and within trying to set us against each other, uh, with social media playing a very destructive role with its pumping out of disinformation. Uh, can we prove that democracies will still work, that our economies will produce uh, income uh, equality more and more, that we will produce growth and greater prosperity, uh, that we will be able to govern ourselves and get hard things done? Uh, we are really at a critical point uh, in our country's history and indeed in the, you know, in the history of the modern world as to what direction people will choose because it's become very apparent that a lot of leaders and their governments are moving more and more in an authoritarian direction. Uh, and we have to, as the United States, once again, try to stand up and make clear that we stand for freedom and equality and opportunity, and we're gonna do everything we can at home and around the world to make good on those values. Secretary Albright, much of diplomacy, as I'm sure you all know better than I, it's cyclical. The ability to lead, the opportunities to have the respect of other nations, the idea of alliances, and as much a lot of work goes into some of the obviously the work and the treaties that you both have spoken about, but it can be undone very easily. But I ask you, um, from your experience in particular, when we think about what we've been through as a nation, not just over the past several years, but the idea that this is not the first time the United States has had to demonstrate some bold leadership to work not only across party lines, but across geographic boundary lines to try to make sure that the collective values of humanity are taken into consideration and are promoted, which is one of the great things that CARE does so well. But I wonder if you can speak to the idea of past truly being prologue in a way of, we have in a way been here before, how do we move to the present day where we can make sure that we can actually capitalize on each of the things that your colleagues have spoken about? Is there a way for us to truly learn from the lessons of having been here before and get back to a point where that collective humanity and opportunities for progress across even the most vulnerable nations can be spearheaded by countries like ours and organizations like CARE? Well, we have been here before and uh, basically because of America's geographical position, we have been able to stay out of things. Uh, we have been we have been protected by two oceans and friendly neighbors on both sides and really kind of a sense that we could go our own way. Um, uh, Secretary Kerry talked about de Tocqueville who was really interested in how the United States came together and what our role was. But I think what um, some of us can remember more closely is that the United States, for instance, I was, I was born in 1937 in Czechoslovakia, a country that uh, had in fact been the first country to be sold down the river to uh, the Nazis uh, by actually our friends for uh, practicing what was known as appeasement, kind of going, uh, letting them take away the freedom of a country that had been created as a result of World War I. And uh, we stayed out of things for a very long time. And I think that uh, when the war really got going and the United States was attacked, then the United States came into World War II and I spent the war in England. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat um, and we spent, we spent the Blitz in London. And it was, I, I'll never forget, even though I was a little girl, when the Americans came in and there were parades of the Yankees who had come in and it changed everything in every single way. And having America come into the war really changed uh, how people in Europe felt, what the possibilities were. So despite our geographical location, we rise to the occasion. Um, and I do think that that is a very important part. Um, actually, John, it was President Clinton who first used the term indispensable. I just used it so often it became identified with me. But there is nothing about the word indispensable that is says alone. It's about partnerships. And I think that's the part that is so important as we now look at the kinds of things 
that Hillary was talking about that need to happen, we have to do it with other countries. We need to, and that is done through the language of diplomacy, of finding uh, how we can find common purpose, what it is that we do together, how we respect each other. We don't harangue our allies. We are, we try very hard to have complementary uh, goals and complementary activities, which is why what is going on now is so incredibly important. And I do think something that goes back to our geography that needs to be mentioned, it is very hard, and uh, my two colleagues here have actually been elected officials. And one, my only regret that I have in life is that I never ran for office because to actually be elected is really stunningly um, em empowering in different ways. But what is important is to try to explain to the American people how domestic and foreign policy go together. And I think that President Biden is doing a remarkable job in explaining why we need to help in other countries, why America's uh, life depends on it, why we are a part of things. And what I do think is so important in our discussion today, that it isn't just the government, it is non-governmental organizations and organizations such as CARE that carry the message literally of how the American people can uh, be helpful through an organization and understand how much our lives and everything about our lives depends on what is happening somewhere else. And what really does bring this message home, because in many ways, war um, is not something that is a, that can have a, a pandemic to it. It is not something that you catch, you watch. But what we really know about COVID is how it, uh, you know, how it spreads. What we have, we can help because we are altruistic, but we also have to help because it helps us. And that relationship of domestic and foreign policy is very important, especially for people that practice diplomacy, because I think it allows us to explain why we need to help each other and why organizations such as CARE can play such an incredible role because they represent not just the government, but the people that really want to help. And Secretary Kerry, to follow up on that, and I think to myself about um, what Secretary Albright's speaking about, the notion that these are human issues. And at, at some point, every human being will be impacted by it and not compartmentalizing to the point where we isolate and a selfish way. But this issue of, as you build on that, vaccine diplomacy has become the zeitgeist conversation in so many ways because of the great fortune, unfortunately, and it's hard to even use the word fortune when you talk about the, the numerical tragedies and the human toll that the COVID-19 pandemic has had globally. But the United States is in a position where at mo many points, supply outpaces demand at a time when other countries are desperate to be able to have access to the demand and supply that we have. And I wonder from your perspective, I mean, I know that CARE is working with low income and middle income countries to obtain COVID-19 doses to balance it in many respects and, um, and to ensure that those doses are distributed in an equitable fashion. And I wonder if you can speak to this idea of how important it is at a time when the United States American can have an opportunity to lead in this way, how vaccine diplomacy and issues of equity can really be a part and probably the most important part of the conversation. Well, we need to not dawdle an instant longer. Uh, and I'm very proud of the president's decision uh, to make sure that America is going to play its appropriate role here. Uh, I don't know how, from any point of view, um, people could say uh, no, and yet obviously there are people saying no, uh, particularly the companies that produced uh, these vaccines quite extraordinarily, and we give them great credit. But mindful, one of them at least received an enormous amount of federal dollars in order to do that. Uh, the notion that profits would come ahead of a global responsibility, but also one where even practically get beyond the emotional sort of gut and, and uh, moral component of the question, practically, uh, from a practicality point of view, our economy is not gonna get going. We're not gonna save the world if every other country in the world is reeling 
with massive deaths that they barely have the opportunity to be able to bury their dead or, or deal day to day. And that is what is happening in some places. This is a pandemic and the definition of the word requires us to operate responsibly globally. I think some people were a little bit um, embarrassed though understanding of the urgency of getting America vaccinated uh, and of trying to get the herd immunity, which apparently, because when some people <clears throat> are on a personal level so troubled by the idea of taking the vaccine or so ideologically driven <clears throat> that they won't consider taking it, that we may not be able to get to that herd immunity. There's just an extraordinary gap in national responsibility on this. But that said, uh, we will have the ability to be able to help vaccinate the world. And if we weren't to do that, I could see, I mean, that would be an irreparable breach in terms of our relationship with most, if not all of the world. I don't know how we do that. And it's quite extraordinary to me that, that, that the forces against it cannot see the implications of our not uh, stepping up here. My hope is that we will rapidly reach an agreement, we'll rapidly be able to move forward. It's not as if these companies aren't going to make money or aren't going to be paid. Uh, but it is clear that if we didn't do that, uh, the, the damage would be untold. Uh, you can't even quantify it at this moment where it might take us by virtue of variants that just build up this remarkable increased immunity and and um, begin to present challenges that bring this all back even to us as a consequence of that. So the logic of going forward is powerful and, and um, it is imperative that we do it uh, as soon as possible. Secretary Clinton, the idea of a profitable pandemic should be an oxymoron, don't you think? I do. I think that's a very uh, good way of saying it, Laura. Um, and I want to just add to what John said that uh, this is a terrific opportunity. We were talking earlier about how the United States regained global leadership, how we rebuilt our relationships, how we were once again viewed as uh, the uh, problem-solving, idealistic, value-driven country that we like to think of ourselves and which has you know, benefited us uh, greatly for many decades. And so we are in a competition though, let's not be you know, shy about saying that. China is using its vaccines uh, for the purpose of diplomacy uh, and they were just approved by the World Health Organization, something that had not happened until uh, just uh, the past days. So now they can with more confidence uh, be the people who come in and say to countries, we're here to help you. We don't know where the United States is, but hey, maybe you ought to get uh, a little closer to us because you can count on us. So in addition to the moral and humanitarian imperatives of us doing everything we can uh, to help the world end this pandemic, we cannot afford uh, to lose the diplomatic competition uh, with China to a much lesser extent Russia because nobody that I know of yet outside of Russia has approved their vaccine. But we are in a, in a race for world opinion, for influence uh, with China. That is part of the future that we have to uh, come to grips with. And so for those uh, who say, well, it's not our business, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, we do, because it's not only the economic uh, consequences, it's the strategic, it's our position of leverage and power in getting what is right and best for the United States, uh, as well as our leadership in the world. So uh, I would just add that um, the sooner we can move to try to um, open up uh, the opportunity for the United States to help uh, vaccinate the world, the better off it will be for us. Secretary Albright, do you feel the same in terms of the idea of 
the the need obviously to understand and reckon with that strategic competition but also the altruism and the moral obligations among trying to um, vaccinate the world i mean as you spoke about the idea of geographic boundaries being one of the reasons the u.s has some level of agency and autonomy of choice about what it delves into but when you're talking about something like a world economy that we're living in obviously we can't be isolationist, dare I say, in our perspective there. I think we are at a time when there are questions about uh, leadership internationally. Uh, we do have to recognize that the last four years have been uh, hurt our reputation beyond measure and that it's going to take time to rebuild and that it, we have an opportunity in order to recapture the idealistic part of our national security policy and the importance of being a country that cares about other people. And that I, I happen to think that Americans are the most generous people in the world. Our problem is sometimes that we have a short attention span. And so what we have to do is explain that this is not just one event, that there are countries that have been really suffering as a result of uh, some of the issues that have to do with the pandemic and some with the kinds of issues that John is dealing with in terms of uh, climate change that is creating uh, immigration and people that are not capable of being able to farm or feed themselves. And so there are any number of issues that all go together. And the United States has the capability not only of helping uh, by our own means, but also of being an international leader in bringing countries together. Uh, we have done that before. The kinds of things that we did during World War II and after World War II, when we really determined that we were in a position <clears throat> to um, be exemplary in the way that we behaved. And I do think it's going to take work. And I'm very <clears throat> always, I, I have to say, I've been very, very pleased by the kinds of statements that the Biden administration has been making and um, the president and the people around him, that also there are meetings, uh, virtually many of them, but some of our leaders are now traveling, talking about where America stands with humility. I think that that is an important part, that we know that we have to make adjustments, that uh, we have the capability of making a difference, but we don't want to and can't do it alone, and that we believe in partnership and allies and developing the structure that isn't, this is not just a, as we kind of weird thing to say, a one shot thing at the moment. Uh, it is basically something that has to be the way that we're gonna operate as America, as a leader in helping others. And Secretary Kerry, you are doing that work in part to make sure that this is idea of a, a long term plan. The president has recently called what's our approach to COVID-19 and re bringing back the economy a marathon. But only the ideas of climate change and our ways and we respond to that is going to be obviously a marathon as well. The attention span of Americans in the globe might be very short, but the long game will be extraordinarily important in that. And to that, I wonder what role do you see, Secretary Kerry, um, young people in particular playing in helping to address this issue of climate change? Are they in a, obviously the future of our world, of our country nonetheless, but what role do you really see them as playing? Is it about as an inform, being able to inform the leadership? Is it about taking on leadership roles? Is it about being more vocal? What do you think is the actual role they should play? Well, Laura, I think they've defined it for themselves. <laughs> like every young generation that comes along. I mean, I think if you go back in, in certainly our history, uh, young people have been a critical component of most of the big transformations in our nation. I certainly go back, Hillary and I and, and Madeline, to the 60s with the uh, civil rights movement, which we all became involved in in 1964 and 5, and, and then on to the women's movement, the, the peace movement, the environment movement. First thing I did when I came back from a war was get involved in Earth Day, 1970. And young people were the ones who created the energy and held the politicians accountable. And out of that came the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water, Marine Mammal Protection, uh, Coastal Zone Management, Endangered Species, and the EPA. All of it created from, you know, the energy of young people who held the uh, alleged adults accountable. 
And that's what's happening today uh, all around the world. Fridays for a Future, uh, 350.org, uh, Sunrise Movement. These young people are demanding that the adults behave and do what they're supposed to do. Those kids can't be in a lot of the boardrooms uh, and they're not on the floor of the House and Senate sufficiently today, but they're demanding accountability. And I think they're getting it at this point in time. Vice President, then at, vice, at the time, Vice President Biden put forward a program when he ran for president. He's now instituting that as president. He's got one of the most far reaching initiatives in history uh, and is determined that the United States will play its role. Uh, so we will need every person there is, young, middle-aged, older, to, in, in, to be part of this battle because we still have deniers in our country. We still have powerful uh, moneyed forces that are still proselytizing lies and, and trying to hold us back from meeting this moment with the future. Uh, the upside of this is actually uh, that this is not a doom and gloom thing that, unless we don't do our jobs. But we're looking at the greatest economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. We're looking at huge economic opportunity, millions of jobs created. We can clean the air, become more secure, have less uh, cancer, less illness because of air quality, less children hospitalized in the summer because of environmentally induced asthma. I mean, all the benefits are just unbelievable, a long list. And the negatives are, are simply that uh, if we didn't do it, uh, then we would inherit the wind with the consequences of all the tipping points that will be crossed. We may cross some of them anyway because of where we are. There's an urgency today to getting this done. But young people are, are uh, way ahead of the one or two older generations too, I guess. And uh, it's young people who are defining the road ahead. And, and I'm, I'm so proud of, of the commitment and energy and daring with which they've spoken up from Greta Thunberg to many, many others around the world. Uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude for really being the ones to have sounded the alarm bell as loud as they did. Now we have to get the job done. And the benefit of doing so is going to be so positive for our economy, new technologies, new fuels, new batteries, new storage, new uh, grid for America. Well, here we are in 2021. We don't even have a grid. The country that went to the moon, the country that invents the vaccines, the country that in, you know, invented the Internet, we cannot send electrons from one side of our country to the other. It's insulting. And it's young people who have uh, demanded something better and we need to give it to them. Secretary Clinton, you know, is something truly different in the air to free up the pun this time around? I mean, we have generations, there's that old phrase, um, out of the mouths of babes, but it's only as good as those who listen and can help to move the needle if they don't have themselves a seat at the table. But as Secretary Kerry is speaking about, they're creating those opportunities. They're, they're almost making it obsolete to have that actual literal seat and are creating different spaces. Does this t generation feel different in terms of being able to finally move the needle in terms of the climate crisis? I think there is a difference. Obviously, um, I, I agree with John that young people have driven a lot of the changes that we have been able to accomplish over the last uh, 60, 70 years. Uh, but now the way that young people can connect globally uh, that they can connect through technology, that they can literally organize online, uh, does seem different. And it's a really exciting development because there's so much energy uh, behind it. And I would also you know, like to just underscore the importance of young people voting. Uh, we saw that in this 2020 election. We saw the turnout among the young uh, going up. And if that happens, if that can be sustained, uh, then elected leaders uh, like John and I used to be uh, will pay more attention because sadly, what often happens, Laura, as you know, because you cover all of this, is that young people demonstrate, they go into the streets, now they go online, they express their strong, passionate feelings, but then they don't vote. 
And so the people who get elected feel absolutely little to no responsibility uh, for responding to the issues that had motivated young people to get into the streets and to get online and to form uh, movements. So I want to see all of the organizing activity married with political and electoral activity uh, to really make the point that young people are not just at the table, they're in the streets, they're online, and yes, they are actually voting. And that combination seems really powerful to me, uh, more than what we've seen in quite some time. Well, let's go to the young people in our rapid, rapid fire section here. I do want to bring in some of the questions from youth around the world. Um, these are young leaders who are part of the Care Action Network, a fine time to bring them in. A group of over, by the way, 200,000 advocates from across the U.S. who are using their voice in the way you're all speaking about to try to advocate for those policies and also address the root causes of global poverty and injustice. And so here's a couple of questions for them if we can. This question comes from care youth advocate, Hannah Lapidus from Massachusetts. And she asked for each of you, um, and she wants a quick reaction here. Uh, Kamala Harris made history as the first woman and woman of color to be the vice president. Tell me one word about your reaction when she became elected. I'll begin with you, Secretary Albright. Great, wow. It should have happened earlier, but we have it now. <laughs> Secretary Clinton? <laughs> elated. Absolutely elated. Secretary Kerry? Elated. We got, we got a word. We got a winner there. Now, this one comes from Mary Abi Karam, who's age 17 from Florida. And she has care about um, whatever the needs will be. Obviously, CARE wants to meet them with the strategies and knowledge we've built over the last 75 years. CARE is working with local communities on vaccine delivery and how this will be accomplished in a fast and fair way over the next months and years. And her question is, what is the best argument we as advocates can make to Congress that the U.S. full investment in global vaccine distribution is essential? Well, I think we were talking about that, and I hope you will take the points that each of us made and really um, go to work on um, reaching out to members of Congress, contacting them, going online uh, to organize others to do the same. But I want to add one additional request, and that is talk to the people in your own families, communities, neighborhoods. Make sure they are vaccinated. Use the information and advocacy that you are learning through your involvement with CARE to try to get more people in our own country to get vaccinated. Because while we are desperately trying to move toward helping the rest of the world, we still have many, many, many millions of people um, who for whatever reason have either not been vaccinated or say they will not be. So we need some of that advocacy right here at home as well. And this one is for Secretary Kerry. Um, a question from CARE youth advocate Allison Bouchong. She's 17. And she says, Secretary Kerry, you were a CARE staffer before law school. What advice do you have for humanitarian and development staff around the world right now? Don't just do your job at CARE. Do your job as a citizen. You've got to be involved and engaged. You've got to vote. You've got to organize. And now... You have to fight for what is right. You have to fight for the truth. We need to reestablish the truth as the baseline of our democracy. And it won't happen without your help, each and every one of you individually. And finally, I'm going to end here because, of course, I'm sure at this point in our lives, everyone's looking for a diversion. They all want to know from each of you. What has been your favorite activity during the pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Albright, I'll begin with you. Knitting. I have made an awful lot of socks. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I can knit without looking at it. There may be an occasional stitch dropped, but knitting is useful. <laughs> See, everyone, that's a that's a way to occupy your thumbs without Twitter. She has an answer for us. We love it. Secretary Clinton, how about you? I have been taking long walks practically every day um, in in some of the beautiful surrounding parks and and state preserves that uh, are near where I live. 
Uh, it was one of the socially distanced activities that I could pursue without uh, worrying about uh, you know, contact, although I did wear my mask uh, even then in the woods. But I think it was you know, essential to my mental health. <laughs> so that's what I've tried to do. A lot of pressure for you to bring it home, Secretary Kerry. What was your activity, favorite activity? We've got knitting, we've got walking the walk, talking the talk. What about you? Well, I'm going for a twofer. I, I, I joined with Hillary on the great walks. I discovered some walks I never knew existed nearby. It was fabulous. But also the fire pit, fire pit, family gatherings, outdoors. And, and we, you know, at Christmas, Christmas Eve, New Year, we had a spectacular time. The fire pit, new discovery. <laughs> with or without s'mores? <laughs> Beg your pardon? With or without the s'mores, that's what you have to have in the fire pit. So. Oh God, I, I, I'm at fault. I never did. I'm right here. I'm, I'm giving you more. Do that, John. I, I'll, I'll show you. All right. Yeah. When, when you I come guess. over, we'll, we'll, we'll do some s'mores. <laughs> well, I just uh, end with a quote from Robert Frost, which fits: "The older I am, the younger are my teachers," and I really do think that that fits very well the conversation we were having about the next generation. I am waiting for them and I look forward to having them be my teachers. Beautifully said, thank you for, we'll let that be the last word. And I can't thank each of you enough for taking the time to join in in this conversation. What a very powerful discussion with moments with world leaders and really about changing the world through moments of care from the 75th anniversary of care to know that the work Although still needs to be done, that they are still fighting the good fight. And each of you have played an instrumental. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.